The Judiciary Committee will come to order, and without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Committee at any time. We welcome everyone to this morning's hearing on Facebook, Google, and Twitter examining the content filtering practices of social media giants. And I'll begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. Today we continue to examine how social media companies filter content on their platforms. At our last hearing, which we held in April, this committee heard from members of Congress, social media personalities, legal experts, and a representative of the news media industry to better understand the concerns surrounding content filtering. Despite our invitations, Facebook, Google, and Twitter declined to send witnesses. Today, we finally have them here. Since our last hearing, we've seen numerous efforts by these companies to improve transparency. Conversely, we've also seen numerous stories in the news of content that's still being unfairly restricted. Just before July 4th, for example, Facebook automatically blocked a post from a Texas newspaper that it claimed contained hate speech. Facebook then asked the paper to review the contents of its page and remove anything that does not comply with Facebook's policy. The text at issue was the Declaration of Independence. Think about that for a moment. If Thomas Jefferson had written the Declaration of Independence on Facebook, that document would have never seen the light of day. No one would be able to see his words because an algorithm automatically flagged it, or at least some portion of it, as hate speech. It was only after public outcry that Facebook noticed this issue and unblocked the post. Facebook may be embarrassed about this example. This committee has the opportunity today to ask, but Facebook also may be inclined to mitigate its responsibility in part because it was likely software, not a human being, that raised an objection to our founding document. Indeed, given the scale of Facebook and other social media platforms, a large portion of their content filtering is performed by algorithms without the need of human assistance. And Facebook is largely free to moderate content on its platform as it sees fit. This is in part because over 20 years ago, Congress exempted online platforms from liability for harms occurring over their services. In 1996, the internet was just taking shape. Congress intended to protect it to spur its growth. It worked because the vibrant internet of today is no doubt a result of Congress's foresight, in part. But the internet of today is almost nothing like the internet of 1996. Today we see that the most successful ideas have blossomed into some of the largest companies on earth. These companies dominate their markets, and perhaps rightfully so, given the quality of their products. However, this begs another question. Are these companies using their market power to push the envelope on filtering decisions to favor the content the companies prefer? Congress must evaluate our laws to ensure that they are achieving their intended purpose. The online environment is becoming more polarized, not less, and there are concerns that discourse is being squelched, not facilitated. Moreover, society as a whole is finding it difficult to define what these social media platforms are and what they do. For example, some would like to think of them as government actors, as public utilities, as advertising agencies, or as media publishers, each with its own set of legal implications and potential shortfalls. It's clear, however, that these platforms need to do a better job explaining how they make decisions to filter content and the rationale for why they do so. Ms. Bickert, you may begin. Thank you. Chairman Goodlatte, Ranking Member Nadler, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Monica Bickert, and I am the Vice President of Global Policy Management at Facebook. We appreciate this committee's hard work as it examines content filtering policies on social media platforms. At Facebook, our mission is to give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. More than two billion people come to our platform each month to stay connected with friends and family, to discover what's going on in the world, to build their businesses, and to share what matters most to them. Freedom of expression is one of our core values, 
And we believe that the Facebook community is richer and stronger when a broad range of viewpoints are represented on our platform. Let me ask the witness to expend, uh, uh, suspend for a moment and uh, let me ask those members of the audience who are displaying things in violation of the decorum of the committee to take them down. Thank you very much and you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. People share billions of pictures, stories, and videos on Facebook every day. Being at the forefront of such a high volume of sharing means that we are also at the forefront of new questions about how to engage in automated and manual content filtering to keep our community safe and vibrant. We know that there have been a number of recent high profile content removal incidents across the political spectrum, and we're working to respond to the concerns raised by the Facebook community, this committee, and others. Let me highlight a few of the things that we are doing. First, we recently published a new version of our community standards, which includes the details of how our reviewers, our content reviewers, apply our policies governing what is and what is not allowed on Facebook. We've also launched an appeals process to enable people to contest our content decisions. We believe this will also enhance the quality of our automated filtering. We've engaged former Senator John Kyle to look at the issue of potential bias against conservative voices. Laura Murphy, a national civil liberties and civil rights leader, is also getting feedback directly from civil rights groups about bias and related topics. As part of Facebook's broader efforts to ensure that time on our platform is well spent, we're also taking steps to reduce the spread of false news. False news is an issue that negatively impacts the quality of discourse on both the right and the left, and we are committed to reducing it. We are working to prioritize news that is trustworthy, informative, and locally relevant. We are partnering with third-party fact-checking organizations to limit the distribution of stories that have been flagged as misleading, sensational, or spammy. We recognize that some people may ask whether, in today's world, it is possible to have a set of fact-checkers that are widely recognized as objective. While we work with the nonpartisan International Fact-Checking Network to make sure all our partners have high standards of accuracy, fairness, and transparency, we know this is still not a perfect process. As a result, our process provides for appeals, and if any one of our fact checkers rates a story as true, we do not downrank that content. Similar to our community standards, we have also published advertising policies that outline which ads are and are not allowed on Facebook. We recently announced changes designed to prevent future abuse in elections and to help ensure that people on Facebook have the information they need to assess political and issue ads. This is significant and challenging engineering work. Our goal is transparency, and we will continue to strive to find the right balance that is not over-inclusive or under-inclusive. We hope that these improvements will ensure that Facebook remains a platform for a wide range of ideas. Before I close, I do want to acknowledge the video bloggers known as Diamond and Silk. We badly mishandled our communications with them, and since then we've worked hard to improve our relationship. We appreciate the perspective that they add to our platform. And finally, I want to reiterate our commitment to building a community that encourages free expression. We recognize that people have questions about our efforts, and we are committed to working with members of this committee, our users, and others to continue this dialogue. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bickert. Ms. Downs, welcome. Thank you. Chairman Goodlatte, Vice Ranking Member Raskin, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Juniper Downs, and I serve as the Global Policy Lead for YouTube. The internet has been a force for creativity, learning, and access to information. Products like Google Search and YouTube have expanded economic opportunity for small businesses, given artists, creators, and journalists a platform to share their work, and enabled billions to benefit from a broader understanding of the world. Supporting the free flow of ideas is core to our mission to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. 
We build tools that empower users to access, create, and share information like never before. We build those products for everyone in the US and around the world. People will value these services only so long as they continue to trust them to work well and provide them with the most relevant and useful information. We have a natural and long-term incentive to make sure that our products work for users of all viewpoints. We strive to make information from the web available to all of our users, but not all speech is protected. Once we are on notice of content that may violate local law, we evaluate it and block it for the relevant jurisdiction. For many issues, such as defamation or hate speech, our legal obligations may vary, as different jurisdictions deal with these complex issues differently. In the case of all legal removals, we share information about government requests for removal in our transparency report. Where we've developed our own content policies, we enforce them in a politically neutral way. Giving preference to content of one political ideology over another would fundamentally conflict with our goal of providing services that work for everyone. Search aims to provide all users with useful and relevant results based on the text of their query. Search handles trillions of queries each year, and 15% of the queries we see each day we've never seen before. For a typical search on Google, there are thousands, even millions of web pages with potentially relevant information. Building a search engine that can serve the most useful and relevant results for all of these queries is a complex challenge that requires ongoing research, quality testing, and investment. Every year, we make thousands of changes to search to improve the quality of our results. In 2017, we ran over 270,000 experiments with trained external evaluators and live user tests, resulting in more than 2,400 improvements to search. We put all possible changes through rigorous user testing and evaluation. We work with external search quality evaluators from a range of backgrounds and geographies to measure the quality of search results on an ongoing basis. These evaluators assess how well a website gives searchers what they're looking for and rate the quality of the results. These ratings help us benchmark so we can meet a high bar for users of Google search all around the world. We publish our search quality evaluator guidelines and make them publicly available through our How Search Works website. Our ranking algorithms have one purpose only, delivering the best possible search results for our users. YouTube's mission is to give everyone a voice and show them the world. It has democratized how stories and whose stories get told. We work to provide a place where people can listen, share, build community, and be successful. To put our work in context, it's important to recognize the scale of our services. More than one and a half billion people come to YouTube every month. We see well over 450 hours of video uploaded every minute. Most of this content is positive. In fact, learning and educational content drives over a billion views on YouTube every single day. Many creators are able to make a living using the platform. YouTube channels making over six figures in revenue are up 40% over the last year. And digital platforms like YouTube have long been a place for breaking news, exposing injustices, and sharing content from previously inaccessible places. We are dedicated to access to information and freedom of expression, but it's not anything goes on YouTube. We've developed robust community guidelines, which we publish to provide clear guidance on the rules of the road. For example, we do not allow pornography, incitement to violence, or harassment. Keeping YouTube free from dangerous, illegal, or illicit content not only protects our users, it's a business imperative. Our policies are crafted to support an environment where creators, advertisers, and viewers alike can thrive. That includes certain restrictions we may apply to content, including disabling advertising on videos that don't comply with our advertiser-friendly guidelines and age-restricting content that may not be appropriate for all audiences. We also provide user controls, like restricted mode, an optional setting for users who want to filter out more mature content. Of course, videos that are unavailable in restricted mode or are not monetized through advertising remain available on the site. We don't always get it right, and sometimes our system makes mistakes. We hear these concerns from creators of all stripes. 
Accordingly, we have a robust process for appeal of both demonetization and removal decisions. We encourage our users to take advantage of this process if they feel we've acted in a way that's inconsistent with our policies. As I mentioned from the start, we build our products for all of our users from all political stripes around the globe. The long-term success of our business is directly related to our ability to earn and maintain the trust of our users. We will continue to pursue that trust by encouraging and acting on feedback on ways we can improve. Thank you for the opportunity to outline our efforts in this space. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Mr. Pickles, welcome. <clears throat> Please turn on your microphone there. Apologies. Uh, Chairman Goodlatz, Vice Ranking Member uh, Raskin, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be, be here today. My name is Nick Pickles. I'm the senior strategist on Twitter's public policy team. Twitter's purpose is to serve the public conversation. We have committed Twitter to help increase the collective health, openness, and civility of public conversation and to hold ourselves publicly accountable towards progress. Twitter's health will be built and measured by how we help encourage more healthy debates, conversations, and critical thinking. Conservatively, abuse, spam, and manipulation detract from it. We are looking to partner with outside experts to help us identify how we measure the health of Twitter, keep us accountable to share our progress with the world, and to establish a way forward for the long term. We strive to protect expression, including views that some of our users may find objectionable or with which they vehemently disagree. We do not believe that censorship will solve societal challenges, nor that removing content will resolve disagreements. Threats of violence, abusive conduct and harassment are an attack on free expression intended to silence the voice of others, thereby robbing Twitter of valuable perspectives and threatening the free expression that we seek to foster. Accordingly, the Twitter rules prohibit this and other types of behavior on our platform. Our rules are not based on ideology or a particular set of beliefs. Instead, the Twitter rules are based on behavior. Accounts that violate our rules can be subject to a range of enforcement actions, including temporary and in some cases permanent suspension. We're increasing the transparency of these decisions so that users better understand our rules and why we are taking action. Because promoted tweets, our ads, are presented to users from accounts they have not chosen to follow, Twitter applies a more robust set of policies that prohibit advertising on, among other things, adult content, potentially unsafe products, and offensive content. We see a range of groups across the political spectrum regularly use our advertising to promote a variety of issues and causes. Our enforcement processes rely both on technology and manual human review. Every day, we have to make tough calls, and we do not always get them right. When we make a mistake, we acknowledge them, and we strive to learn from them. For example, our decision to halt Congresswoman Blackburn's campaign launch advertisement was a mistake. And when it was brought to our attention, we rectified it the same day. We apologized to her campaign at the time, and I'd like to apologize to her again today. Importantly, the tweet itself was never removed from Twitter. We've made significant progress combating abuse and manipulation, but our work will never be complete. We have made more than 30 policy and product changes since the beginning of last year. Additionally, we recently took steps to remove locked accounts from follower accounts globally. This step will ensure that indicators that users rely on to make judgments about an account are as accurate as possible. This change applies to all accounts active on the platform, regardless of the content they post. We also recently have integrated new behavioral signals into how tweets are presented in search results and conversations, targeting behavior that may not, viol may not violate our rules, but is disruptive. Significantly, this approach enables us to improve the overall health of the platform without always needing to remove content. Some critics have described these efforts as a banning of conservative voices. Let me make clear to the committee today that these claims are unfounded and false. In fact, we have deliberately taken this behavior-led approach as a robust defense against bias, as it requires us to define and act upon bad, bad, bad conduct, not a specific type of speech. Our success as a company depends on making Twitter a safe place for free expression. We are proud of the work we do in the world. However, we will never rest on our laurels. 
As senior strategist, my role is at the intersection of public policy, product, and trust and safety work. This juncture is unique in allowing an insight into how our company defends free expression, and I hope to provide both insight and reassurance to the committee today. Thank you again, and I look forward to your questions.